Marty, thank you for joining us. You know, in your many years at Goldman Sachs, even as the chief financial officer, all your years in trading, you've thought about risk for a long time. And when you look forward over the next five to 10 years, what do you think the next big risk is? Well, Sonali, one thing that I uh, experienced over 26 years in, in finance is there's always a new risk that you thought about a little bit before it really materialized, but usually didn't take it seriously enough. In most cases, just found it really too hard to do anything about, but you knew it was there. And then it really materialized, right? So. When I started off, everything that I was working on was about market price risk, and then suddenly we became deeply aware of counterparty credit risk, particularly in derivatives. And then around the LTCM uh, event, became very concerned about liquidity risk and other kinds of systemic risk. And then we had, of course, the financial crisis where there was an interconnectedness also uh, along with liquidity risk and capital adequacy became a huge emphasis for the Fed and others. And so it just, it just keeps evolving. So what I'm going to tell you is something that's not going to surprise you, which is, which is software risk. I think it's more fashionable to call it cybersecurity, right? We're all deeply aware that, um, that that's a huge and evolving landscape of risk, not new, but it just keeps coming and it's going to keep coming in ways that are very difficult to foresee. So we're here right now with some of the worst cyber attacks we've seen in recent history. And, you know, when you look ahead, what is your nightmare scenario? Well, um, I think one of the, the great things about working on Wall Street is you, you, you trained to think of all the things uh, that can go wrong and then actually do something to mitigate those risks right now. Um, that's also one of the challenges of working on Wall Street, in other words, it, it can be really damaging for one's peace of mind because you're constantly thinking of things that could go wrong. So, so in our discussion, I mean, it, these are some of the things that I lie awake at night thinking about. It doesn't mean that they're going to happen, um, but my brain just kind of goes to that mode of in any complex system, what are the many things that can go wrong? And I want to Think of all of them if I possibly can, right? And so, so here's, here's one. As more and more financial instruments, financial assets become dematerialized, right? So, so think, of, think of treasury bonds. Most of us have never really seen a treasury bond. Like who's seen a physical paper certificate for a million dollar treasury yet? They're traded in million dollar clips every millisecond of every day, right? They don't really exist in that paper form. And, and generally the dematerialization is a really good thing, right? So in Hurricane Sandy, when we found out that some share certificates actually existed as paper certificates in a flooded basement somewhere at a clearinghouse, right? It didn't seem like that was a great way to store share certificates. So dematerialization is a good thing. But as more and more things dematerialize, then it really becomes essentially pure cybersecurity and software risk. And so if you think about things that are really fundamental, like if you were really worried about things that could go wrong, you would think, well, where do all those treasury bills exist? And where do all those dollars exist? And are there central points of failure? In other words, who's recording the beneficial owner of all those treasury bonds? And it's got to be in some computer somewhere. Who owns those computers? How are they backed up? Are they warm, cold, or hot backups? What are the redundancy and resiliency? And so really anything relating to the central bank is something that keeps me awake at night. You're talking about a coordinated hack on the Federal Reserve. And in this crisis, the Fed yeah. um, has proved itself in terms of sure you know, how central it is to our economy, um, yes. our livelihood, our well-being. And so, you know... What is at stake here, and why is it the Fed in particular that you're so worried about in terms of um, anything kind of toying with what it owns and what it oversees? Well, first of all, I just have to start by saying I, my hat's off to the Fed, right? In terms of how the Fed approaches risk management and the seriousness of its job and thinking of all the things that can go wrong, um, 
capital adequacy for the banks, um, the, the functioning, the smooth functioning of the banks during the pandemic is a tribute, of course, to the banks and also especially to the work of the Fed in the capital adequacy framework, CCAR, right? So, so nothing but praise for the Fed. It just is inevitable that if you are the creator of the currency that is the global reserve asset, that's a, that's, that's a one of a kind responsibility, right? If, so where do all those dollars exist? I spend time thinking about these things, right? They, a, a lot of it exists in paper form, but a lot of those paper bills are actually outside the country. And many of the other dollars exist in the form of balances held by banks with their overseeing Federal Reserve System bank. And treasuries also exist in book entry form, which is electronic software, cyber form, um, again, again, managed by the Fed. So it's just this immense uh, responsibility. And, and I know the Fed takes it with the imme immense seriousness and has incredible people working on it, but it really is the root of the entire global financial system, the movement of dollars and treasuries, right? Now, help a person, um, you know, somebody who's not well-versed in finance understand what's at stake here. If somebody were to kind of get a hold of, you know, the Fed's register, what would happen? Well, so we got a, I think what you have to call a tiny harbinger of that a few years ago. You'll remember, Sonali, the Bank of Bangladesh, the central bank, um, had its SWIFT credentials hacked and money was transferred from its account um, at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and went into some casinos uh, in the Philippines and Macau and most of it was never seen again. Uh, apparently got turned into chips and, and walked out the door. Now that wasn't a hack of the Federal Reserve's systems super important to uh, to mention that but it was the hack of the firewall defenses of a customer of the Federal Reserve um, that happened to be the central bank of an independent and sovereign sovereign nation so that's why I'll call it a tiny tiny harbinger right and it was it was well over a hundred million dollars I I don't keep track of all the bank heists that have ever happened, but that's got to be way up there, if not at the, at the top of the list, right? So, so yesterday to walk into a bank and ask for bags of cash when you can just uh, hack, a, hack a router and steal SWIFT credentials and, and send real money away. But it does get you to thinking, right? What if some master accounts that had a real lot of money in them were raided or what about if the accounts that show who owns which treasury securities were somehow altered in a subtle way that was hard to detect, um, but that eventually led to a systematic mistrust of who owns what, which dollars against which treasuries. That's the kind of scenario that my, my brain goes to. Now, cyber risks in particular is something that financial executives have been warning about for some time. And given it's something that you're so concerned about right now, too, do you think that the industry is adequately prepared for it? Well, Sonali, certainly the industry takes it with extreme seriousness. Um, but it is also uh, just as certain. I mean, this is what's so, this is what's so troubling about about cybersecurity risk, right? Any, any sufficiently complicated piece of software that is what I'll call Turing equivalent, meaning it can compute anything that can be computed, is also hackable. The two things, the two things go together, right? It's the reason we have viruses in life and we have viruses in, in computers. There's nothing that you can do to say that a system is, uh, is free of the possibility of being hacked. And so you can never rest on your accomplishments and no matter how good a job you're doing, you should always be very worried. And there's always, as I mentioned at the outset when you're talking about these risks, there's always another level. So here's a level that the industry has now arrived at 
and many firms are taking very seriously, which is in the earlier versions of cybersecurity, they would say we're going to defend our perimeter. We're going to have an extremely strong perimeter. It's going to be very, very hard to get in. But if you were able to get in, it was like the Maginot line, right? Or maybe you could just drive around it, right? Once you got in, then you're just in the squishy interior that isn't really protected at all. So that approach of having a very strong perimeter only takes you so far. Mm -hmm. So the new frontier that banks and many other firms are working on right now, and it's terribly important, is um, taking a page from what companies have learned by putting their computing in, in the cloud. Right? The cloud does a, the cloud providers do a first class job on cybersecurity, arguably better that any, than any firm that wasn't in the cloud business could possibly achieve on its own. And one of the things you do when you put your business and your data on the cloud is you assume that all those computers are hostile and could potentially have been suborned or their, their, their data being leaked. And so here's what you do, Sonali. You then assume that all of your own computers are potentially hostile. You no longer assume that there's a safe perimeter of trust of your own computers. You assume they're hostile too. You're, you're leaning on another topic here that I know is very important to you. You've told me that you're more concerned about non-financial companies than you are about financial companies. Um, and so what is that concern? On one hand, I hear this great sense of trust in some of the tech companies, especially as it pertains to the cloud. But on the other hand, there are real risks as these firms get a lot bigger. Well, so in, in that spirit that there's, there's always risks and we can, never, we can never rest comfortably, sure, I do, I do have concerns, right? So let's say that during the pandemic, I, like so many others, um, found great comfort when I saw the, the, the delivery truck um, go, up the, go up the road, right? That was, that was the lifeline to everything. Right? And, and, and similarly, I have a, a high-speed connection to the internet. That is also the lifeline, right? If, if those things go, then we got a real problem. So it certainly got me to thinking about supply chains generally and resiliency. And certainly there's been a lot of discussion of this. Um, and so I'm thinking a lot about what the Federal Reserve created for and with the banks that led to the resiliency that the banks demonstrated during the pandemic. Well, it's requiring the banks to have reserves of capital and reserves of liquidity, more than would be optimal if you were planning for everything to work perfectly. Similarly, non-financial companies have evolved just-in-time supply chains. Everything is priced to perfection. We don't want to make or store too many cotton swabs or Pyrex glass pieces because that's just inventory and that's bad for returns to tie up capital and inventory. So let's just make all the supply chains timed perfectly. That's risky. So what you're talking about here, in, in fact, is a, a stress test on the big tech companies in some fashion. Yes, Do absolutely. You think that that's actually uh, closer than we think, especially as this new administration really starts to take a look at what big tech companies look like? Well, it's certainly my recommendation, and, and I'm not the only person um, with these kinds of recommendations. So I always want to say, let's start with something that we know worked, right? So if you go back to the early days of the, the CCAR stress scenario, many naysayers said, well, how are you going to figure out a severely adverse scenario? Or what, what kind of hat are you going to pull it out of? Or it could be worse than that, or maybe it's not so bad, or is it a reasonable one? And then, and then the idea of requiring banks to simulate their entire operation through the financial statements, cash flow, income statement, balance sheet, nine quarters in the future, that sounds impossible so that they could then demonstrate that they can continue to lend during that stress. It all seemed almost like science fiction, like such a heavy lift to make all that happen, and yet the Federal Reserve did it. The so same can be done here. What would it look like for the tech companies? What would an example of a stress test look like? What should, gov what should governments be looking for? So as, 
as an example, let's take, so we talked a little bit about supply chain and logistics uh, companies, digital businesses that get merchandise to their, to their customers. And there's been an awful lot of discussion. Let's go to a, a different example of a, of a social media business, right? So there, if you look at the core, the core business model, the core business model has some challenges that remind me of the pre-regulated banks business model challenges, right? So, and, and it's nothing particular to these companies. It is just in the nature of untrammeled, unrestricted profit maximization. So if your business model is maximize profits, like every good capitalist enterprise, and if your model is we maximize profits by maximizing advertising revenue, because that's our only stream, and we maximize advertising revenue by maximizing engagement and time on site, and we maximize engagement and time on site by maximizing emotional resonance, particularly outrage, by confirming biases. I mean, as we've seen, this has led to all kinds of consequences that really are classic externalities, right? They're, 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 it's, it's no different in principle from a company that's making some chemical product and just flushing its waste into a river. For the so, company, it's optimal. So is that you saying that uh, you're more concerned about the Facebooks and Twitters of the world than you are about um, the Amazons of the world, just by nature of what they do? I think, Sonali, uh, it's my nature to just be concerned about everything and, and everybody. And, and it's really a classic concern of antitrust regulation, right? What are anti-competitive behaviors that happen when a company has been wildly successful and what happens when you have completely unrestrained profit maximization. So now the banks have been restrained by having capital and liquidity requirements. It's sensible. And the whole idea of the banking regulation is so that in a negative event, the banks still have collectively sufficient capital to capitalize themselves. They don't have to go to the taxpayer for more capital. I think the same principle applies to all the tech companies. It happens with every industry, going back to automobiles, oil, telecoms, you name it, the industry becomes sufficiently powerful and it's doing what capitalist enterprise is supposed to do, maximize profits. And then the government has to step in and tie those profits to externalities. Well, here's a question for you then. You know, you, I know you're a believer in technology fundamentally, but do you do you think, though, that uh, the types of technology we are creating are no longer doing a service to society? So, Sonali, they're, they're doing a service to society. I'm 100% I'm confident in that, just as the banks have always been doing a service to society. The question is the unintended systemic side effects. And you know, as we now have with the banks, we require the banks to have extra capital and liquidity for that rainy day so that the banks can look after themselves, don't need to go to society uh, to, 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 to pay for it. The same thing needs to happen with big tech. It has reached a level of such success and such concentration and such inequality, right? It's a, it's a power law, unbelievable wealth created. And so, these companies have the wealth, let's hold them accountable for the systemic side effects on society. So if there is an epidemic of low self-esteem or inequality or fiction being propagated on social media, leading to behaviors in real life, those are all negative consequences for society. I'm not gonna opine on whether those negative consequences out outweigh the benefits so that they're net negative. All I'm saying is that these companies need to capitalize themselves for these negative side effects and that right. simulation framework is a way to get at it. Well, that simulation framework, you know, in the bank, and when we're talking about the banks, we're talking about money. We're talking about something that's countable. But when we're talking about technology companies, you're talking about a societal impact. You're talking about self-esteem. You're talking about misinformation. And you're talking about, um, you're talking about 
other societal inequality, what should regulators be looking at to monitor for in this stress test of the big tech firms? Yeah, so this is this is why we're it's so hard, Sonali. We're at that same juncture that we were at a few years ago, maybe roughly 10 years ago, when it seemed nearly impossible to quantify a severely adverse scenario, right? To even come up with a severely adverse scenario connecting unemployment and inflation and the stock market level and commercial activity. Like, how, how can you even do that? that? Nobody really had a great idea for how to do that in some principled, systematic way. And then even once you have that, how were you going to get banks to measure things like interconnectedness, right? That was a really hard one. We, we all had a sense that there was something that happened when banks got really interconnected with one another. Or how about complexity? There was a sense that just being complex was itself a source of risk. How do you measure that? And similarly, a lot of people thought that that's got to be nearly impossible. And yet, I profoundly believe that anything, anything at all, can be made measurable. Is the measure going to be perfect? It certainly will not be perfect. At best, it will be a proxy. It will be correlated. We'll discover in another crisis that it wasn't such a good measure after all, but it's something. You can't just throw up your hands and say it's too hard to measure. So can you be clear then also about the social inequalities that you're most worried about as these big tech firms have gained so much power? Well, so I think it is just in the nature of, of anything digital um, that uh, the, the distribution of outcomes is not the, the bell curve distribution, the Gaussian distribution, like say height and weight in a population of human beings, right? There's a median and there's a standard deviation. Unfortunately, in digital businesses, um, there's a network effect and it really is winner take all. I think this has always been in the nature of capitalism that's why we've had antitrust legislation for oil and telecoms and so on. That's why we've had food and drug regulation for a long time. I am concerned that as these businesses become pure software, as they become themselves artificial intelligences that are guiding and directing our behavior and our thoughts, that these inequalities, these power law distributions of outcomes are only going to become graver. And, and so I think you just accept that that's the reality, that these riches are going to be increasingly more complicated. And then there I would just say, that's fine. But because there are these riches, we can't have the companies generate these riches and then say to society, oh, there were some unfortunate side effects. We had all the benefits. The rest of the world had all the, the negative side effects. The companies themselves have to capitalize for those negative outcomes. It is doable. So one more real question for you, Marty, that's tying this back to the first thing you said. You had been speaking about uh, concerns about the financial system and decentralization and what happens. Um, when things are not physical anymore, when they are in the cloud or some other place. That's happening with currency very quickly as we speak. So, you know, when you think about how currencies across the world are becoming decentralized, how are you concerned about Bitcoin and other countries that are creating their own currencies? Wow, that's such a good question. Let me see if I can come up with a, the, a concise answer. Um, uh, that that question deserves. So years ago, I remember one of my favorite venture capitalists introduced me to the CEOs of several of his Bitcoin companies. They were doing things in Bitcoin. And one of them was, uh, I was talking to him and I said, and this is 10 years ago, almost as an offhand remark, I'm highly confident that the Federal Reserve will complete the digital journey of the dollar. And one day the dollar will become completely dematerialized. It's mostly dematerialized. It'll just go all the way and the dollar will become a digital asset. Or if you want to call it a cryptocurrency, you could call it that. And 
uh, the person I was talking to said, that will never happen. And I said, well, I've been trained the hard way, never say never. And can you tell me why that will never happen? And he said, it will never happen because no engineer who's any good would ever help the Federal Reserve do that. And I tell that story because it, it indicates another kind of polarization, which I think is going away and getting better, which I would call maybe a Wall Street Silicon Valley polarization, where neither side deeply understands what the other side is up to. Well, I'm happy to say that there's an awful lot of crossing over between those, those two worlds. But yes, I can, I, you know, I'm not privy to the inner debates of the Federal Reserve, but I can tell you that across the world, central banks are having this debate. And we know it because they're writing about it. They're publishing papers. There are some uh, countries whose central banks are deeply concerned that they're going to lose control of monetary policy because their currency might simply be replaced with some other digital alternative that had less friction. And so if you think about the ultimate currency, which is the dollar, here's one thing I will say. Um, while I'm fascinated by the technical underpinnings of Bitcoin and all the cyber current, the, the, the cryptocurrencies, you got to remember what is currency, right? And what is legal tender? And fundamentally, it's an intersubjective reality. It's something we all agree has reality. And it has reality because we all agree it has reality. It's got a social political reality. And that social political reality is not going away. At the same time, for the dollar to remain competitive as the global reserve currency, and it, it depends on so many things. It depends on economic well-being. It depends on social policy, domestic policy, trade policy, foreign policy, lots of other, other things. I will also submit to you, it depends on the format. And if you have another currency that is in a purely digital format that's programmable, that currency is going to evolve faster and it's going to be able to do more things. And that is an important feature of a currency as well. So where I see this all going is in a new ecosystem that's going to have multiple digital assets, and some of them will have more the flavor of commodities, some will have more the flavor of currency, some will be used for portfolio diversification, some will be used for payments, and there, I would expect, is going to be a vigorous competition internationally for the digital currency that has the right properties of anonymity traded off against know your client and anti-money laundering that lets the central bank set the levers of monetary policy that is consistent with a country's trade policy and is purely digital. That is going to happen.